And well, let's dive right into it. So this will be purely a regularization talk. So I, I will not speak much about any particular models. Everything will be based on saying, well, we'll have a linear image problem. So I have some measurements, which I will write as F, which is some ideal measurement that I don't, I don't have access to plus some noise. And really what, what you have is only both together. And this will be what we will be trying to measure. We will try to recover our real functions that live in some domain in our D, where D is the dimension that will play a role in what we do later. And the assumption will be, I mean, some, of course, this is potentially ill posed. You need to inject some prior information to get something reasonable. And the, the assumption of the prior that we will want to assume is. Uh, that the true data actually consists of distinct objects, which we call objects something like smooth areas separated by sharp discontinuous edges. So this could really, this should be allowed to jump. And this happens in a number of areas. So something like image processing, where you could have something like deep learning. You could also try to recover some inclusions and some, something more physical, or if you're if what you're trying to get looks like a set block and phantom, then certainly it will be quite piecewise continuous, uh, quite piecewise continuous. Okay, and the setup will be will to do this, we will try to minimize something. So we'll have perfect uh, knowledge of our operator, which is say here. And we will assume that it maps from some LQ of this domain into some other Banach space. And then we will also be able to put an exponent in the normal fidelity term here. And with this, you can pose a regularization functional. So you choose a regularization parameter, which will be a priori in our case. And you define some kind of regularization functional that encodes this a priori information that you have. And well, by doing this, you balance the a priori information from the, from the regularization and staying true to your measurement. Okay, so a short word about why these choices or what's important and what's not important in these choices up here is um, here for what, what I will be trying to do, the, we are trying to mix not only the classical theory of uh, regularization, which mostly happens in a setting of purely functional analysis, either Hilbert space or Banach spaces, without, let's say, caring too much about what they are, do, what we're going to do needs to happen in LQ and often with Q, which is not two. So that's why I chose this space from the start. And then if you are already in Banach, in Banach spaces and not Hilbert, then well, I, you could put a different LP as target, but then you have uh, the notation gets worse. So we can just keep the, the, the Y as some generic space. And the Sigma we can write needs to be greater than one. So a canonical choice more or less is two, but it doesn't need to be two. So I will just write two to make things a little bit simpler in the day. So what, is, what will this regulation function functional be? Uh, it's already in the title of the talk, right? But I will try to motivate it shortly. Uh, so we want to combine something, uh, measuring smoothness, which means something like derivatives, but you also need to allow these continuities in, the, in your solutions. And to try to convince yourself of what could you write that is useful for this, uh, one could make a 1D pixel like this, or so just work on the unit interval, and have th these three different functions that go from zero to one. They are all monotone. So two of them are differentiable, and one of them is just a step function. Uh, if we would take the, the second power, um, the L2 norm of the gradient, then this would increase as the functions get steeper and eventually it will, for the, for the step function, it, it's just infinite, it doesn't exist. However, if you take the, the L1 norm of the gradient, then it's invariant to how fast you go up. So in both cases, you'll get one because you, the derivative is positive. You just do fundamental theorem of calculus and you get one minus zero, one. Um, Somehow this idea that you are, the speed at which you're going is not important, suggests that maybe what you actually want to use is the L1 norm of the derivative. And in fact, we would expect that if we were able to define 
this first nor L1 norm of the derivative of this U of this step function, you would get one. But, but how do you do that? Well, you do that in a weak way. And what we call the total variation is the distributional gradient as a vector value random measure. So given a function U, I test it with divariances of vector fields of smooth, compactly supported, which are smooth and compactly supported, and whose pointwise length, so in L infinity, is less than or equal to one. So you do it just right one. And if this is finite for U in L1 lock, then let's, I mean, you could take away the lock, but we make this choice. Then we say that U has bound variation, and it's in this space that we, well, functions of bounded variation. And if this were, if you were smooth, then it's not hard to see. Uh, smooth as in really smooth, like C something. Then you will get the L1 norm of the, of the grain, which is what you wanted to generalize. And this also induces a, a concept of length of boundaries of sets, because now you are able to jump in your function. So you can just take the indicatrix, the characteristic function. So the characteristic function is just one if your point is in the set and zero otherwise. And for this function, we can take its total variation. Hopefully it's finite. And we call this the perimeter of the set. So basically you, and this actually generalizes the length of the boundary of the set. If you take something really nice like this disk, then you are measuring the length of the boundary just by the divergence theorem. So if you find a set, which is completely aligned to the normal, you will get one everywhere and you will get exactly the length. And in fact, for, for such a nice set, for, for a disk, it's, it's really possible. Well, possible not with C0 infinity, but you will, you will be able to do it, at least in the limit. And in particular, this notion allows you for formulas like this. You have perimeter of, uh, you have two sets. And you consider their intersection and their union. Uh, you, are, you, would be, you are able to count in this way, just in the same way as you do for boundaries of, norm, um, boundaries of smooth sets. So this would be an equality case, but it doesn't need to be if you would take them in such a way that they have tangential contact, then you will lose something and this will be actually an equality. Okay, so of course, this will be the, the R that we will that we want to pick for our regulations. Okay, and if you have a um, regularization scheme, the first thing that you would try to ask theoretically is what, what does it converge? What happens when the noise tends to zero? Is, is it consistent? Uh, when the noise tends to zero and the, and the alpha goes to zero with it. And the basic convergence result that you can get for, for total variation is something that happened a long time ago in the very beginning of this business, which is if you take a quadratic parameter choice and well, you have your, your Q of the exponent has something to do with the sublevel embedding of, 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 the, of the bounded variation of sublevel one, one, then the um, Solutions will converge weakly in this d over d minus one uh, to a u dagger, which we'll, we'll keep using, which is a minimal solution of the minimal exact solution of the equation, provided it exists. Minimal in the sense of the regularization, in the sense of total variation. Um, maybe there is not only one because nothing is unique here, but we'll keep using the symbol anyway. And so this happens just by the obvious bounds, like taking u equals zero, uh, the more easy things you can do, and using just compactness of the, I mean, compactness of the embed. So compact, weak compactness and then strong compactness by really Kondrakov in a, by losing a bit of exponent. So what you can do is I put this lock here just for, just in case the domain is unbounded, otherwise it doesn't even need to be locked. So by losing a bit of, of this exponent, you you also get strong convergence. But this is a bit sad because you, 
I mean, here you really have a strict inequality and you are not even able to converge in the space that you started with. So that's not a very good regularization scheme, let's say. Or I wouldn't find it very satisfactory. What else can be done that is classical in this field is, well, you could try to look for convergence rates and then the situation is even worse because you can actually, you can only really do this in Breckman distance, which I will define soon. And there are source conditions that it relates um, this minimal solution with some element which needs to live in the subgradient of TV at this minimal solution. And combine, of course, with the, with the adjoint of the operator and with a linear parameter choice. So you need to regularize more than out there. So what are these concepts that I just wrote? If you have some functional that lives on a, let's say on a Banach space X, you can define the subgradient, which is a set valued function, hopefully not empty. And it behaves well for convex functions. And this lives in the dual of X. And this is just defined to be all the elements which act as, a, as the slope of a lower um, of a linear functional that touches the function from below and stays below. So it is exactly here, like in this picture. So you have this, this F, which is convex, and you're able to put lines below it. And the, let's say the generalization of the slope, so the element of the dual that defines this line is precisely the element of the circuit. And in this, in this framework, what you can do is you have a, a very nice characterization of minimality for unconstrained problems. So you have that U is in the, it minimizes this functional. If and only if zero is in the subway. So the classical differential, differentiable situation would be, well, the derivative is just zero because this differential would be unique and it equals the derivative at every point. But if you are not, uh, not necessarily differentiable, it's still convex. You just need to have a horizontal tangent to this to this function from below. And if you already know all of this, and you have the source condition that we just defined, so you have an element in the subgradient which is in the in the range of the adjoint operator, then you can define this sort of Breckman distance, which is telling you how far you are from being in the subgrade or how far you are from the, in terms of total variation, how fast are you moving compared to what the subgradient would be telling you. And well, this is written in terms of the, of the regularization function on itself, which is not very nice because you really cannot translate this into norms unless this would be the, the functional would be strongly convex, but total variation is not. Usually it looks like this because it has a one norm. So I mean, you're really doing. And classically, that is, that is as far as you can go. And you can get convergence in a norm which is worse than the original one or convergent rates in something which is not even a norm. And actually, for the, what you would like to apply this functional, the, um, the norm is not even that interesting, I would argue, because the prior was, well, you have some sort of objects that live in your image, and these are well separated by maybe discontinuities. But if you measure in LP norm, then this is not very adequate to know if your objects are really close to each other or not. So, and um, an example to illustrate this is, let's if I would have two characteristic functions, so really you have two circles and I compare, I compare their characteristic functions. What you would get is the measure of the symmetric difference. So points that are in one and not in the other and in the other and in one. So this is really this, the area, which is in gray here. Is, the, is exactly the LP norm of the difference of this characteristic function. And if you have the situation 
picture here on the left, and you say, well, these circles are very close, I'm happy. But if you have a situation that, that appears here on the right, then you will have the, a similar area, which is in the difference. But I would really like to say that this, this blue tentacle thing is not a good approximation of the circle. Uh, so what's a better way to measure this? Something you can do is think of the Hausdorff distance. And specifically Hausdorff distance of the boundaries of the set. So what does this mean? Uh, what you do here is to take distance of a point. Uh, let me see if I do it correctly. From Y to the boundary of U and then take the supremum over all possible distances and then see if it tries the whole thing. So in this case, well, the, here you're just the farthest away from one boundary to the other that you can go is something like this. But on the right side in your bad example, then you are really very far. And this can be interpreted. I mean, it's a, it's really a definition, but you could see this as some geometric version of uniform convergence. So if you, if this, if the house of distance is low, then all of your points are close. And what you could like to have is to have this for the um, boundaries of level sets of your functions, which is some proxy for the objects that are in there. So something that you could segment immediately by thresholding are well, which is precisely the level. And actually, if one looks at this picture, um, the blue set has some, uh, has um, uh, what's so special about this blue set here, both in the left side, both of them had low curvature, but in the right side, the blue one to get away with not so much uh, area inside it needs to have a lot of curvature, at least in some points. And what's the relation between curvature of, and total variation? Uh, if you could, if you would take just the Euler Lagrange equation, if you were allowed to do it, of the of the one norm of the L one norm of the gradient, you would get something like this right hand side here, which is just uh, yeah, what you could call the one Laplace. And on the left-hand side from the data term, well, we're gonna get just the usual thing, right? The adjunct that appears when you take the derivative, I just made everything here L2 so that you don't have any duality mappings or anything strange, but you get your solution applied with the operator minus measurement apply adjunct operator. And this is actually valid if everything is smooth and the grain is not zero, then this right-hand side is really the mean curvature of your levels at the point where you are. So really, if you think of the gradient as the normal of a level set, and then you take the divergence, then you will see exactly the mean curve. So that's fine in principle, but this is really very far from the functions that you're expecting to see from this kind of regularization. Um, artificial, but in some way also typical. Example would be, let's say we have this characteristic function of this train set, I apply some blur, I apply some noise, but I have, because I have access to the original thing. Then numerically, I apply some total variation regularization. Uh, well, you get something like this. And uh, you get something which is much sharper, not quite fully. And here I will, if what I'm trying to recover is just only this object, and I'm interested in the geometry of the object, I have to define what the recovered object is. So if I had zero as a background and one inside, I will just define it to be half. And the half level set uh, looks like some, something like this is plotted in here, which is close to the original one, but not quite. And still here you would say, well, I want, uh, I want to talk about the curvature of the set, but the problem is that this formula is extremely far from true because the gradient here does not even exist. I mean, I'm exactly interested in the Yangs. Uh, so what you can do rigorously is 
to use this upgrade in, that's really fine. And so yeah, let's take this kind of derivative. And we can define this left-hand side that came from the data term to be just something which we call V depending on parameter choice and noise. And this needs to live in the subgradient of TV. And just to repeat, the subgradient of TV can also be written as this inequality here. And what does this have to do with the level sets? Because we were talking about level sets right now, uh, just now. Actually, in terms of uh, the total variation, it had this property that it doesn't care how far, how fast you go up from one value to another in one D. The translation in more dimensions is that you can write it just stacking the perimeters of all of the level sets. So this was the characteristic function of this of this level. So just to find the total variation, you can you can make horizontal slices like this and say, well, what is the perimeter? I have one circle here, another circle here. So I just need to add this this length of this of the circles, and you will get the, to the complete total variation just by integral. And there is also um, Analogous thing without the without derivative, which is the layer cake formula or the Cavalieri principle, which is if you have a positive function, uh, you can also find integrals by summing the level sets. So uh, this is just taking the integrals in a horizontal way. Just see at which level how much mass you have and integrate. And this is also a version of Fubini, you could you could call. It. Okay, and What's interesting is here I had just uh, some integrals which are potentially easy to write, and this can be done. So, if you take that inequality that we have before, you can split it into many inequalities depending on t, and for each of them you get that the the level set, at least up to signs here, I assume t greater than zero, just to, to make everything simple you get that these are minimizers of some problem that the, is formulated over these sets of finite perimeters. So sets for which the perimeter is fine. And this is perimeter minus this V that came from the fidelity term that we had before. And this is actually, I mean, being a minimizer of this kind of functional is actually the definition, not made by me, made by some, uh, some Italian, some, some time ago in, in the calculus of variations is they call this having a variational curvature, this dual variable V alpha dot. And just looking at this level, if everything was smooth, then being a minimizer of this function would also mean that you have as, as a mean curvature of the minimizer of the boundary of this minimizer would be exactly this function that you have inside the integral. Okay, but this is, Slightly strange, one could say, because you, you are calling a curvature a function which actually lives in, in the whole domain. But this is somehow the price that you pay. You define all of your lengths and all of your derivatives in a weak way for, from integrals. So when you talk about quantities derived from them, they were also made in terms of integrals. And of course, this is quite, this is very, not unique. I mean, for a for a V, you could have many different sets, which are all all have this variational curvature. They are just at different points, and as I said they are quite non-local. However, what we will we'll be interested in, and it's quite nice, is that if one looks at this functional, just making a quick heuristic, you could say, well, which kind of uh, what does um, what kind of uh, geometry is this encoded? And if you would assume that your this v that appears in the in the integral term is lives in L d with d of dimension, then you could ma just make a whole inequality and look for a, let's say for a ball and say this will scale like r to the r to the d minus one, which is exactly the same scaling as the perimeter. So if this norm is very small, you will not be encouraging small structures. 
because at some point they are, the energy says, no, you should not do this because the, you cannot go down enough with the second term without going too far up with the first. Of course, this is just for balls, but uh, in a sense, the, a lot of the rest of the talk is trying to make this about really the minimizers. And we were talking about house of convergence of boundary. And it's actually very related to, to the curvature. And what you could say is if, you, if your UN have a common compact support and you converge in a one lock, which you had by the basic covariance, then, well, then it's not even locked because you have common compact support, right? Then the area of the symmetric difference goes to zero for at least almost every P because it's all the big integral, so it needs to take away all this measure zero. And to improve to house of convergence of all these level sets, what would you need to show is that you don't have um, sharp tips or small structures, well, like exactly this tentacle that was appearing, or if you have a little ball that appears on one side, then that would also be bad for you. And the way to formalize this, which will really give you this house of convergence without with a simple computation, just trying to make a small contradiction with sequences, is if you were able to find some scale, which we call R0, and some constant, which is positive, such that if you look at your set or at your level set here, if you look at any point which lives on the boundary and you make and you take a ball around it of less radius than the scale, which is universal, I mean universal from your proof, but it works for all of the levels at once, then the fraction of area which is inside and outside of the ball from this level set is always bounded below. So you never get very thin and you never get very small. And if you have something which is really tiny, then if your R zero is big, then that also prevents it because it's big compared to the size of a little. And what's important is to make this a statement about convergence is this need to be uniform in the sequence, so n was for the noise, for the regularization parameter and the noise, and also on every point. So this would say that you never create anything which is too small at any point of your regularization scheme as you try to converge. And this was proved first by, in this paper of some ball and co-authors for denoising. And we try to extend this to, to further situations. And the general proof scheme for this is you realize that your problem lives in the in LQ star and you have, and it will also involve these V's, the very same V's that should belong to LD. And then you, you, you can realize that if you are, if you, take away the noise, then your dual variables will converge strongly. Plus you will have some stability with respect to the noise. And with both of them, you would be able to go back to this density. Um, I'm not being that fast. So let me skip the example I will come here, but I will say, I will only say that, um, why do you do Banach spaces? Well, this could be necessary either from the operator because well, it might not be, if you are working on an LP scale, it might not really be bounded in L2. Or it can also come from the vari total variation itself. You can really make counter examples. And if you look at the dual of the problem that we started with, uh, because this total variation is one of homogeneous, so you can characterize the subgradient as being in the subgradient at zero, and this kind of uh, inner product or duality product needs to really equal the value of the function. So what you end up with is you try to maximize along P's, which is just some, some variable that lives in the dual of my measurement space. And it needs to be such when you such that when you apply the adjunct operator it needs to live in this subgrade at zero. And then you try to align it as much as possible. We are trying to get close to this equation. 
with some compensation with, with a square norm that comes from the from the regularization itself. Okay. And in this case, well, you can check your standard qualification condition because the A is continuous and the norm as well. So you have strong duality. And well, the optimality condition that comes from this is well the same one that you already had before. So you have B equal is is something which comes from the adjunct operator and lives in the subrange of T. Okay. And what you can do at that case, when I mean, you had this dual, which is to try to maximize duality product minus some norm. Well, you can take minus so that it's minimized because you like it more. And what you can do is add a term which does not, because it doesn't involve the variable that you're minimizing with. And then you have two norm, two square norms and uh, something that looks like an inner product. So this sounds like completing the square, which you would be able to do in a Hilbert space. And since projections into convex sets are contractive, then this would give you a, a stability estimate with respect to with respect to the W with the noise. And, and actually the left-hand side still makes sense in Manach space. And it's exactly what you got, it's exactly your problem. And in fact, um, of this in, on a panic space, this equality here is not true. But what you can do is just look at the left and try to get the stability anyway. And this works if you assume that your measurement space, your Y, your Banach space is relatively nice. This comes from uniform convexity of the dual. And what you end up with is you get with a, you get a stability estimate for this piece, for this. Uh, dual variables before applying the adjunct operator, which depends on the modulus of uniform convexity. Of the dual norm. Of the dual norm square. That's why it has a two, because it's exactly what you have to begin. And this means, and this is again a linear parameter. So and what this means is, well, by, by just by choosing enough regularization and I mean choosing alpha big enough and applying A star to all of this, you will get that the curvatures can be as close as you want in the target of the adjunct operator. Okay, so you were trying to go to the problem with alpha zero, so you're really trying to converge. And the formal limit is, well, you had the th same thing that you had before, but before you had a norm, which is not there anymore. So here you lost your strong duality because the fidelity term became a constraint that is now not continuous. But what restores the strong duality is exactly having the same source condition from Burger and us. So you have a source term that, uh, that you can apply the adjoint with, adjoint to which lives in the subway. And this will also give you, just by a relatively easy computation, if you take away the noise, then this piece will converge actually strongly. So somehow your the dual problem completed the primal one. You already have a better situation than you had before because before you could only converge quickly, but now you can converge strong. And this just comes from one homogeneity of TB and the Radon Rich property of Y star, which we assumed was a reasonably nice balance space. And if these functions are converged strongly, then the V as well, which are applied with adjoint. And what you get is that this, this, uh, this sequence is then equi-integrable in, the, in LD, which means that you can, for each epsilon, you can find them a size such that at every point you integrate with a ball of this size you can, you can control this by action. And this is uniform in both the point and the sequence. And how to find, use this information now? Well, what you can do is just test your, your level set 
in the minimization problem for the level sets with something which is a modified version. You basically cut a little piece. And what you're able to do is look at all of these tests at once. So you make this depending on R. Just by counting, you get an inequality like this, which tells you the green part here has to do with the, diff with the perimeter of all of this, all of what you took away and the integral on it. And since you already had your stability for these dual variables, which are exactly what appears in there, you can first make a holder inequality, get mass to the something, LD norm of the dual, split the noise because just by triangular inequality. And these two terms you can control. So this is equi-integrable and this is stability. So with all the choices you made, you can make this as small as you like. And if you use an isoperimetric inequality in, in what you had before, you convert everything into masses and you just end up with this term. So this is a differential inequality that you can integrate and it leads exactly to what you want. The, that this mass goes like r to the b. So it doesn't grow too small, too, uh, too slowly or too big. You can make variants of all of this for directly boundary conditions, which means just you count the, the jumps at the boundary, but you make the functions just go to zero or without counting the jumps on the boundary. So this is all just either making a barrier at the boundary or using a point carrying inequality instead of the isoperimetric inequality. And at some point, I assume that I had common combat support for all of these functions, but this is not necessary. You can do something similar to say that they will not escape to infinity. And what you end up proving is, uh, well, the, common, the compact support you can do only for the exact exponent. So the exact dual exponent of LD because LB is the curvature and initially in the dual, which is the, yeah, the adjoint of what you started. So exactly for this case, if Q is really this value and you have either the full space or a bounded domain with whichever boundary conditions you like. And you have a, here I reintroduced the sigma, but this is linear parameter choice. Uh, with some constant that depends on everything in a very not explicit way, but it's really a, an actual number. It's not any number. It's above this particular constant. And you have the source condition. Then you have really this convergence in a geometric way. So your objects in the images go uniformly to the limit. And once you have all of this, you have these density estimates, this do not create small things uh, for the whole sequence, what you can also realize is I mean, you had a minimal size for for what you can create. But if you have a function which is unbounded, but it still lives in L something, then well, the level sets will have to be small because otherwise you have just too much integral. And uh, but at all of these levels that go far up, this uh, this universal scale of how how small your things can be, your level sets can be, also applies, which will tell you that eventually you have an L infinity bound, which is, I find, I find kind of nice. I mean, it's also in a more standard terminology than this convergence of level sets. So if you assume the same thing as before, well, you have all of the same assumptions as before, then you can find a constant, which depends on what you limit. Um, how you took the parameters within this parameter choice, then which uh, bounds your function from above and from below. And if omega is bounded, this also tells you that you converge strongly in LP for all P up to, up to infinity, but not including. Which is nice because, well, at least you, now you have strong convergence in your original space, which is not something that you could get at the very beginning. And this is not completely trivial because the measurements could be unbounded. If you say, well, this is deterministic noise, it could be anything in these spaces or it could be unbounded itself. Or even if it's bounded, then well, you still have A to deal with. So maybe 
the most reasonable explanation for a bounded measurement is not a bounded function, but the solution will always be bounded. However, this you assume the source condition and the source condition says that the limit will be also bounded itself. And the bound is not explicit since it was made by using equi-integrability of this noiseless thing. So this has to do with the geometry, uh, with how the, you, how the minimal norm solution in the limit looks like in a spatial way. So if you have something which is very small somewhere, then this will be high there. And to summarize, the, the bounds are really not explicit. And how does this look numerically? Numerically, you can just, uh, well, you can keep reducing your regularization parameter and your noise in a linear way. And this is in accordance with the theorem, which says, well, you will, your level sets will be getting close to the limit. So they are converging to this characteristic function. So the convergence is uniform, but the rate, it, the rate which we really prove nothing about is related to how much curvature you have to limit. So here you are far away because this was a thinner structure. And just very quickly, something one could ask if this, uh, this situation is satisfactory, I would say not quite because you can make very simple examples like the characteristic function of a square in which the subgradient is really empty. And this has nothing to do with the operator. It's just by TV itself. However, this, uh, if you make this even without noise, then this, this works perfectly fine. You, know, you can make an explicit solution and see that your theorem is true, even though you cannot prove it. Uh, so a classical um, standard question would be, can you avoid the source condition? And in short, the answer so far is this can be done, but only for the indicatrix of some arbitrary set. So by completely different methods, which are much more geometrical by really looking at what these sets look like, in particular, the limit set, uh, you can find an inequality for these noiseless curvatures, which are depending on, on the limit. And still add your noise because you have still the same kind of stability and end up with some the density estimates, on which are actually the scales are getting smaller as you get closer to the set because you assume no regularity at all. But you will have this, this convergence of light. And um, yes, that's everything I had to say. And um, well, as the summary is for TV regularization, then you have. The duals are really the curvatures of the level sets. Uh, you will need Banach spaces, and this is a short summary of the thing. And yes, thank you for listening.